Hi, everybody. Um, thank you to, for attending today, and thank you for the uh, excellent team at the York and North Yorkshire Lep for helping us uh, make this happen. Um, I think we've been kind of overwhelmed by the support out there with, uh, I believe, there's over 370 people attending today. Um, pretty good going, actually, to be honest. Um, we will be recording the event, so if you miss anything, you can watch again or, um, and share it onto your networks as well, which would be really important. Uh, let me just uh, give you a bit of uh, info about who <clears throat> we are, Environmental Smart. We're a non-profit organisation that seeks to shift social attitudes um, and we provide opportunities in education, into the environment, for community groups to, to get involved and help deliver actions to, to help um, with the environment. Uh, they range from hands-on opportunities like planting trees or environmental DNA projects, assisted in science, um, we provide traditional skills education for recycling and repurposing and uh, have renewable energy in our portfolio as well. So, but our main aim really is to encourage communities to get involved in the work that's happening in their local area. So, but I'm not here to explain the donut today. I'm going to leave that to the expert in the room. Um, but I do see this as an opportunity for businesses, um, local authorities and communities to come together to collaborate on a future to help us thrive and prosper. Um, and we can use the donut as a compass to, to achieve our goals. Um, it helps us identify shortfalls. It also identifies positives as well as negatives. Um, and it also inter identifies the impact that we're having on the planet. Um, I've got a couple of examples here. Uh, one of them would be, for instance, York is threatened by flooding almost every year. And we can have some positive actions in Rydale around natural capital to slow the flow and prevent the water getting to York in the first place. Or community energy is a, is a huge thing that, that needs to be enabled in this country. Um, you know, it, it can reduce carbon, obviously. It can reduce um, energy bills, which would help us tackle fuel poverty at the same time. But we can't get it going yet because we have a traditional old grid and we really need to have, make some real positive change in that, that uh, arena as well. Um, but for me, I, I want to empower communities to get involved in, in, in with the LEP, in with local authorities, and how we collaborate together to actually make this future happen. So I will be putting in a link to a sign-up form in the chat today, and we will be sending out after, to, to gather um, details of people who really want to help us make some change happen. Uh, have some housekeeping to do. Uh, our guests are going to take you through actions that are happening right now, plans that are on the table for the future to reduce carbon, and then finally Kate will introduce the donor economics to us all. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to Christian Vasey from York City Council, who's going to chair the meeting and introduce the, the other guests. Um, uh, the other bit of housekeeping we have is we do, there will be opportunity for questions after. So we ask you to use the Q&A feature in, in the webinar for your questions to the speakers. But it would be nice to actually get an understanding of who's in the room. So if you can use the chat to introduce yourselves, we can see who's, who's in and where the interest is lying. So, um, and again, don't forget to sign up and get involved. Um, Christian, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so truly great to welcome so many people. Um, what we're seeking to do this morning is to look at the principles of donut economics in the context of three organizations, two local authority or local authority areas and a regional local enterprise partnership. You'll first hear from the organizations who are going to give a sense of how we are currently engaging with sustainable development goals. And then we'll give the virtual floor to the author of Donut Economics, Kate Raworth, who will set out how Donut economics works and then hopefully give us a sense of how the donut visual framework might help our three organizations engage better uh, with the environmental challenges that we all face in our collective drive to create a sustainable future. Um, for the local authorities of York and Rydale and for the regional local enterprise partnership, the challenge is the same as for everyone else on the planet. So I think we'll have useful examples from this. How do we assure that we thrive into the future without damaging the world upon which we all depend? 
How do we deliver and develop social equity, gender equality, peace, justice, improve education, and all those things we want to do while protecting our environment and biodiversity. So we'll start by hearing a little from the three organizations. Um, and we will start with uh, James Farrar and then Katie Privet from the lab. Uh, thank, thank you, Christian. Uh, and firstly, welcome everybody, and uh, uh, in particular to Kate uh, for, for coming this morning and, uh, and kind of providing this workshop. I think we're at uh, quite a unique um, position, a unique sense of opportunity. I mean, this last year has been incredibly difficult on a, on a global scale uh, with both the economic and the, the health impact of, of COVID-19. Uh, but any crisis creates an opportunity. Um, and, and actually, we've got to take this as an opportunity. And I think it particularly creates an opportunity for an area like York and North Yorkshire. So one thing that we've learned in the last year is that you can live anywhere and work anywhere. And therefore, quality of life and quality of place will be a much bigger driver in where people want to be. And therefore, what places will be successful and what places won't be successful. So I think as we look to stimulate the, the recovery from COVID-19, it's really, really important that we don't look to um, get back to where we were. We, we, we must respond in a way which is greener, which is fairer and which is stronger. Uh, and if we do that as a York and North Yorkshire region, I think it's unquestionable that we will be really prosperous in the future. And actually all our residents will have more opportunities, they'll be healthier uh, and our environment will be better protected. So I'm really excited about what might come out of today. And I'll hand over to Katie Privet now, but I, I think this is a fantastic opportunity for York and North Yorkshire and one that we absolutely must grasp. Thanks, James. Um, I'm going to take you through very briefly a little bit more of the technical detail of, of where York and North Yorkshire are at and how we've got there. So we have uh, recently finished a um, commission, um, a big piece of work joint with our colleagues over at West Yorkshire Combined Authority, which we call our carbon abatement pathways. And it's modelled out um, really clearly pathways to net zero and beyond for our highest uh, emitting sectors. Alongside the modelling, the sort of technical details, there's then the policy recommendations. How do we, what measures do we need to introduce to get to follow those pathways? And what policy do we have to put forward to enable that change? So that's across um, national policy, so lo lobbying national government and working with uh, national and regional partners. Local policy, enforcing and, and um, proposing new legislation at a local level. Enabling actions, so working directly with partners such as colleges to build skills or um, uh, community groups to engage um, a wider community in decarbonisation and capital projects and programmes, where's the money going to come from um, to, to make these things work. Um, the modelling has projected that the earliest possible net zero date for York and North Yorkshire is 2034 and our aim is by 2040 for York and North Yorkshire to be operating as a carbon negative sector economy. Um, this is just a flavour of some of the excellent graphs and models we've got. I'm not going to try and go through these, but just to show you, this is taking us from our 7.8 megatons of carbon in, in 2020 and shows you the extent of change we can make in 2030 and 2038. Um, this is a flavour of some of the measures we need to be putting forward. So we need to almost double our forest area by 2038. We need to have installed 270,000 heat pumps by then. Um, and we need to have increased cycling by nine times compared to today. Um, all very, very ambitious aims, but something that, that we're really hoping can be doable. Um, and this is a flavour of those policy recommendations that we're going to need to deliver to make those things happen. Um, there are 90 of these in total, so this is just a small snapshot. Um, but it's brilliant uh, to have this really encompassing piece of work on carbon. Yes, it is very much just on carbon emissions and it's not the whole picture in that point of view. Uh, that's half of our sort of scoping work going forwards. The other part is on the circular economy, as I mentioned. We're a leader in circular economy in York and North Yorkshire. Um, only the one of three places uh, that had, uh, sorry, in the UK at least, that had a circular economy strategy. Uh, there was London, then there was Glasgow, then there was York and North Yorkshire, which I think says something about the, the level of ambition we're going for here. 
we've had our strategy in place uh, for, since November 2019. It was very much stakeholder informed, so it was developed by people who are passionate about circular economy and by people that were interested to, to drive it forward. Now what we're doing at the moment is getting more of that numbers uh, type of work similar to what we've had in the carbon abatements pathway and really providing that investment case um, behind the circular economy and identifying the biggest opportunities in um, carbon terms, in social value terms and economic value um, and seeking out those enablers. How do we make those things happen? So those two things together will build into a route map for a carbon negative region. Um, and that's what we're working on at the moment. We're aligning pieces of research at the left and strategies at the left um, at the moment and making sure that there's nothing in our own processes that's gonna get in the way of this progress. Um, we're also at the moment just setting up stakeholder roundtables. Um, if you're interested in joining any of those, by the way, um, pop in the chat and I'll, I'll make sure you get the right invites. Um, but uh, the stakeholder roundtables are for kind of um, senior level experts and decision makers to sit down and really thrash out of these pieces of research. What is it that we feel confident we can take forward today and what are we planning for? in six months time, in 12 months time, and really get a strong governance structure around that, which is gonna be a challenging piece of work, but really exciting. Um, and the plan is to work through that and have a drafted route map um, by later this year, by around September time. So that's just a quick flash through what we're uh, up to at uh, York and North Yorkshire LEP. Um, just a few contact details there for James, for myself, I'm Katie Privet, and uh, Katie Thomas is the Senior Strategy Manager for this area of work. Thanks very much. Thanks Katie, that's brilliant uh, and that gives us a big overview of the region and the amount of work that's going in which is very significant. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Sue Jefferson who is leading Circular Malton in Rydale. Uh, Sue. Uh, thank you very much everybody and I'm so excited about uh, being here and I think this is to really just talk to you about putting some of those theories and the technologies but into practice um, and to highlight you don't have to be a person who understands how all this works. Um, uh, we were inspired by the let's vision and support and uh, from what we've seen. And I'm one of a handful of volunteers who decided to develop the idea of uh, creating a circular market town. We thought it's a perfect size to drive positive change at pace and bring everyone with you. But actually it can work with bigger towns, it can work with villages and so on. So I'm just going to give you a um, headline, but again, you can go via the let to find out more about us. And I think this vision says it all. It's not just really about economic growth. It's not just about reducing carbon. The end point is a thriving uh, town and people happy and healthy within it, which is so important. And our focus is very much on collaboration and getting people to work together and work differently. But it's really important, I think, to highlight that um, this, this is to work for everybody from a school to a pensioner, someone who's really active in climate change, to someone who's um, passive, not interested, not sure at all. So everyone can play their part. And our focus is on resources, making sure we really um, value them, but actually we can put as much value and, uh, and leverage from that as possible. And we're not just doing it for our town, we're, we're very much positioning ourselves to be a pilot for the rest of Yorkshire to roll out, but also the UK and see the impact we can have and how we've gone about it uh, with multiple effects. And again, that by the LEP, we're producing town guides so others can use that. It could just be a, a handful of crazy people, but when we have been uh, engaging our residents and businesses, I'm telling you, we were so excited to see the support that we had. Almost nine out of 10 people in, in our two towns um, are really up for us doing this. And this has given us a momentum to keep going um, and invest our, our time and, and so on. And nothing will stop us now with this support behind us. 
I'm not really going to go into sort of lots of detail now, but we've got a, a 10 year program of exciting plans underway. Um, the first is looking at our uh, food waste. We're known as uh, Yorkshire's food capital. So, but we all have food waste from our houses, our, our restaurants and cafes and so on, and, and some of our manufacturing bases. So we're looking for our food waste to be converted into heating and powering our town. Um, and that's an uh, initiative that's well underway in, in uh, um, feasibility and development stuff at this stage. But I think what I'd like to leave with you is from a standing start, from people not knowing what circular economy was all about, we've got the community are very much ready and, and up for this. We've got initiatives that are ready uh, to go. All the answers lie out there with, with other experts if we work together. And what I'm really looking forward to is embracing the donut economics thinking to help us sort of step change further to both plan and measure our impact. And to say, uh, this isn't just for our town, uh, this is to roll out across Yorkshire and across the UK uh, from the ground up um, and, uh, and see that change come and come fast. So that's um, all I had to say, thank you. That's fantastic, Sue. Thank you very much for that. And it's great to see the huge level of public support there is for all of this. And I certainly see the same uh, in York. And it's a, a big shift from where we were a decade ago or 15 years ago, where it was still slightly eccentric to engage with some of these issues. And that definitely has changed. So I will now give you a short uh, summary of what we're doing in York and put it into that context. As Katie said earlier, it's not just about carbon emissions. And I think that's what I want to focus on because I think it leads into to what uh, to Kate will be talking about. So York's a tourism city. People come to us from all over the country and around the world, but when we want time off, we go somewhere else. My thoughts this morning are about how to create places where we can all spend more time enjoying where we are. As York's Climate Change Committee has done its work over the past 18 months, we've learned a great deal about transport, heating, carbon emissions, divestment, passive housing, carbon pathways, and on and on and on. Our cross-party committee was instrumental in persuading the administration to appoint a head of carbon reduction, and we're proud of that. But something called the Derwentthorpe development is a big red warning light in York. It shows us that without holistic thinking, we're possibly on a road to nowhere. Imagine you re retrofit all the houses in York. We're beginning to do that. The city council has committed to building 650 passive house standard council homes. And we're engaging in our zero carbon uh, pathway, working with the local enterprise partnership and, and beginning to get to grips with the size of the challenge in front of us. If the City Council commits to a zero carbon council by 2030, we will effectively be committing to retrofitting over 7,000 council homes at a cost of hundreds of millions. We are shifting our park and ride buses to all electric fleet. We're expanding our cycle network. We're about to adopt a pollinator strategy. We've, uh, um, we've recently, in fact, last weekend, I was helping to wildflower so 7,000 square meters of of uh, roadside verge. Our pension fund across the region is teetering on the edge of committing to major green infrastructure investment. But Derwentthorpe is a big red warning light. So what is Derwentthorpe? Let me explain. Derwentthorpe is a great sustainable housing development built in around 2010 to demonstrate the environmental benefit of energy efficient homes. Only when researchers went back to check how it had all gone in 2015-16, they found that the carbon footprints were no lower than anywhere else. While the City Council declared a climate emergency in March 2019 and committed to deliver a zero carbon York by 2030, the more we learn on the Climate Change Committee, which I chair, the more we understand that creating a zero carbon future is not something that local authorities can do to a city. 
It's something we only do with a city, with its residents, its businesses and its community groups. Imagine all the households in York are retrofitted to passive house standard and all energy bills have dropped by around a thousand pounds a year. Have we cut carbon emissions dramatically? The best I can give you is perhaps. If all those household find low carbon things to do with their energy bill windfall, the extra thousand pounds of disposable income, then the answer is yes. If the money saved is all spent on shopping, flights, travel, and all the other things that we could do with it, and as apparently is what happened in Derwentthorpe, then the answer is no. Of course, I understand that fuel poverty means that there are a significant number of households where there is no disposable income windfall, if we may call the houses uh, zero carbon. But the point I think remains. So my local authority has to engage with creating the new economy we have shied away from for ages, for decades. Climate change is, is not just about carb cutting carbon emissions. It's much more than that. So how do we create, from my perspective as a city councillor, how do we create new leisure opportunities for a city of 200,000 people in the context of creating a new economy? How do we create opportunities for exercise, adventure, well-being, fun, entertainment and community that don't cost the earth? Things that don't require us to travel 50 miles to the coast or a thousand miles by plane. When the whole model of a life well spent has been based on going further and further afield for, ad for adventure and excitement. My family loves camping. We go to France and we erect a tent. The first few days when we wake up, we grab a fistful of leaflets and we think, right, where are we going? We jump in the car and go somewhere exciting. Only on day three, usually, do we actually wake up and say, stop. Why don't we just stay here? Why don't we enjoy being here? So the new economic model for York will have to include this in my view. And I think that's hopefully where we're going to be going, what we'll be hearing from Ruth. We have to create a future where we can have wonderful days off and weekends close to home without burning liters of fuel, an economic model that creates jobs closer to home. I've seen this model in action in France. In Dijon and in Poitiers, they've created lakes with beaches and campsites, nature reserves, restaurants, rowing, canoeing, rural walks, nature trails. In Dijon, they've got a tram network that goes way out into the countryside. They're shaping the future around a sustainable development and a sustainable economy. I'm not advocating an end to travel, foreign travel, or an end to days at, at the seaside. I am advocating, and I think we're learning in York, that we need to shift towards ensuring that those of us who are lucky enough to have leisure opportunities need to find ways of doing that closer to home and local authorities and regions and government has a part to play and business in helping create that new world and I think we can make it happen. So that's my summary of York uh, and I'm delighted now to introduce Kate Raworth. Uh, I'll just say a few words and I have to say, Kate, this is picked off wiki. So whether it's, whether it's true or not, we will find out. Um, I understand, Kate, that you developed the donut diagram to illustrate economic perspectives in a paper for Oxfam in 2012. Uh, good, got that bit right. And that since then you've elaborated on it in your book in 2017. Uh, seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. Um, I also learned that you worked uh, on a micro-enterprise development in Zanzibar in the late 90s, that you've worked with the UN, and that you're currently a senior research associate at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Simultaneously, I hear that you're a senior associate at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, and given the argy-bargy that goes on between those institutions uh, on an annual basis in the boat race, I hope you don't have any interest in rowing. And I hope no one's noticed that you're playing for both teams. Um, with that, I will pass over to you, Kate, and really looking forward to hearing what you've got to tell us. Thank you so much, Christian. That's a great introduction. Um, 
What it didn't say on Wikipedia, though, is uh, I so I live in Oxford. That's where I'm sitting right now in East Oxford. But what Wikipedia doesn't tell you is that my dad's family is actually originally from Harrogate and my mum's family is from Derbyshire. So I don't know whether you, you would think that makes me a near neighbour or really a distant rival like Oxford, Cambridge. I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's really lovely to connect with you all. And I have to say, it's just so impressive what everyone's already presented and also just seeing this incredible connections happening in the chat of people just showing up wanting to connect with each other so and I love the graph that <clears throat> Sue showed saying people saying yes yes we want to do this here what an amazing piece of information to have and as you said Sue that just gives you all the drive to say we're going to make this happen so it's just it's just brilliant to join you all and hear about the ongoing initiatives and and the work and I'm just going to share some ideas from Donut Economics that I hope um, contribute to it so what it didn't say on Wikipedia, which I'm most proud of, is that I'm the co-founder of Donut Economics Action Lab. So yes, I wrote a book called Donut Economics, it came out in 2017. And I spent um, two years really going around giving presentations because the book had more traction than I imagined. Who knew the world was ready to, to create a new economy? But always after every presentation, somebody would come up to me and say, well, I'm a teacher and I'm actually teaching this. It's not in the syllabus, but I know the students deserve to learn it. Or I'm a, I'm a town councillor and I'm going to put this on the table at our next meeting. Or I'm a sustainability officer in a company and I'm going to put this on the table in the boardroom. Or I'm a community activist and I'm going to take this back to our next meetup. So it was really clear to me that people wanted to put this in action. And so we founded Donut Economics Action Lab to say, let's make it possible for people across the world to connect. I've seen there's people from Newcastle in Australia here, right? So people all over the world wanting to learn with each other from each other and turn this idea into action. So it's been just a brilliant journey so far. And I, I believe the key to it is peer to peer inspiration, right? So when one mayor says, we're going to do this, that is what inspires other mayors and counselors. Wow, this isn't just an idea. It's a thing. A teacher inspires a teacher, a school girl inspires school girls, uh, CEOs inspire CEOs. So here's to the work you're doing, because I have no doubt that what you're doing and pioneering in your cities and region about carbon carbon negative, not even carbon neutral. Come on, let's go beyond that. Nature doesn't do neutral, right? Let's go carbon negative and circular. That energy that you're creating, I have no, no doubt is going to inspire across the UK and, and far beyond. So I'm really delighted to be here. So I'm going to share my screen to, to share some ideas in the room. And I'm going to just frame this today around the idea of can York and Rydale live within the donut? And I know there's more than York and Rydale in York and North Yorkshire. So just forgive me for giving to taking these as, as a focus for the ideas. But anybody on, the, on this call, you know, think of it of where you are, whichever city you're in, whichever district or village or town. As Sue said, this can, these ideas can be done, whether it's circularity or the donut, at multiple scales and we can adapt it. So I'm going to dive in, but I'm going to pull back first. I'm going to pull right back and just say, let's just think how the 21st century has begun. It's begun with repeated crises from the financial meltdown of 2008 to the ongoing year of climate and ecological breakdown to COVID lockdown that we're all still enduring, at least in the UK. And these crises tell us that they hit with really sharp inequalities of gender and of race, of wealth and power, inequalities between the global north and the global south. But they show us how deeply interconnected we are with each other and with the rest of the living world. And for me, what's fascinating about all of these, although we hear of them differently in the news and we might think of them differently, actually, if you think about it, they all emerge from the systems that we create that are based on this idea of endless expansion. So if you have a financial system that thinks it succeeds by endlessly expanding, you're probably going to get a subprime mortgage market kicking off. If you have an industrial and, and uh, energy system that thinks it succeeds by endlessly using fossil fuels and earth resources, we're going to induce climate and ecological breakdown. And if we have uh, human settlements that are endlessly expanding into wildlife areas and then as Christian was describing people endlessly traveling between countries we create perfect conditions for a global health pandemic so we need a new vision of what progress and prosperity looks like and I think it's not endless expansion and for that therefore I offer the donut as one way of framing human prosperity in the 21st century so the goal here is to leave nobody in the hole in the middle that's where people are falling short on having enough resources to meet their essential needs like food, health, education, decent housing, gender equality, political voice, income, energy. These are crowdsourced from the world's governments, from the Sustainable Development Goals. The power of that is that the governments of the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meet these. This is not controversial. Leave nobody in the world in the hole in the middle of the donut. But at the same time, as we use Earth's resources, 
we need to make sure that we don't overshoot that ecological ceiling because that's where we put so much pressure on this unique delicately balanced living planet in the universe that we begin to kick her life supporting systems out of balance and that's how we cause climate breakdown and we acidify the oceans and we break down the web of life and we create a hole in the ozone layer these are the nine planetary boundaries identified by scientists only over a decade ago just only a decade it's so recent that we're beginning to understand what it is our well-being depends upon so if that's the goal to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet the problem of course as we know is we are very far from that and all the red here shows you the extent to which people worldwide are falling short on meeting their essential needs we were talking about food waste here that red wedge on food goes 11% towards the center of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. You can see that there's a huge deprivations on all of those. And many of those people live in the global south in low income countries, but we all know we can walk out the doors in our own cities and see people living in extraordinary deprivation in the midst of plenty, even in the global north. But we're already at the same time overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. So we are out of balance on both sides. And this is, I think, our generational challenge to come back within this from both sides at the same time. And just reflecting on that, last century's economists never saw this picture. Last century's business leaders, last century's politicians and governments never saw this. So why would we think that their economic theories, their business models and their policies would solve it? Because they weren't designed to solve it. This is our challenge. We're the ones to see this and to get this. And we have to come up with new theories and practices and business models and policies and community action and ways of living that solve for this. And we can see that as an overwhelming challenge or we can see that an extraordinary exciting opportunity for which our children and grandchildren will turn around and hold us accountable of what did you do once you knew. So what are we going to do? This is the donut at the global scale, right? This is the whole world and the whole planet. But of course, most policy making decision making happens at a lower scale. So here's three countries, and this is brilliant research by researchers at Leeds University who did 150 national donuts. So we've got at one end Malawi, as you can see a lot of red, falling short on meeting the, the needs of most people, but well within the ecological ceiling. So not on, on a per person basis, putting almost no pressure on the planet. Got in the middle, and that's on a, an economy generating around thousand dollars per person per year. We've got China in the middle on seventeen thousand dollars per person per year, both falling short on some pretty essential um, human needs and already an ecological overshoot. And then we've got the UK on forty four thousand dollars per person per year, almost meeting the needs of people. At, and this is a very low global bar. So we know in the UK that actually many people live in shocking deprivation, requiring food banks, energy poverty housing conditions, access to education. There are huge inequalities, we know, but this is a global bar. And in fact, all high income countries like ours should be completely blue in the center because we know we have the resources to make everybody have a decent basic standard of living. But even here, we've got a little bit of um, red there on inequalities. That sounds true to what I know of the UK, but we are massively in overshoot on those planetary boundaries. Look at that impact on CO2 emissions, on material footprint, on resource use, on, on uh, water, on fertilizer use. So we need to come back within. Now that's the national scale. Let's go down again another level. What if we to bring this to the scale of the city? And this is the work we've really been doing with the donut over the last couple of years. And so I'm gonna just apply it to, oh, no, before I go there, sorry. I wanna show you 150 nations plotted here. And there are the three countries I just mentioned, Malawi, China, and the UK. Now, all countries have gone trying to get into that top left-hand corner where the donut is right, where we meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. Low income nations are, need to do that in a way that no country before them has ever done. Because every country before them has overshot planetary boundaries in terms of meeting people's needs. So how can these lower income nations, Malawi and many others, meet people's needs without putting the pressure on the planet that all before them have done? How can middle income nations meet people's needs for the first time, but already come back within planetary boundaries? And then high income nations like the UK and many others equally have a huge distance to travel to come back within planetary boundaries. So for me, this diagram tells us there's no such thing as a developed country. And I invite everybody actually to no longer think in terms of developing countries and developed countries. There's not a single developed country here because even the richest countries that seem to have a good lifestyle are living in such a way that it's actually undermining the life support systems of our planetary home and destroying the prospects for all others to achieve that. 
We also have to remember there are really powerful relationships between countries. And I'm talking about histories of colonialism, military power, World Bank policies in the 1980s of structural adjustment, current finance and trade rules, resource extraction for low-income countries, and then the impacts of climate change falling first and hardest on low-income nations. So we need to transform our economies within nations, but also the relationships between. Now that work happens largely at the level of national governments. And so I'm now gonna go down a level to cities. And for today, I'm gonna to focus now on York. What if we bring this question to the city of York? So here's the question we invite all ambitious 21st century cities to ask themselves. How can York become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? That's the question. And how we answer it differs in every place. So it breaks down into four sub-questions that are social and ecological, that are local and global. First one is what would it mean for the people of York to thrive? Well, of course we have to ask who are the people of York? In all their diversity, with all their different histories for why they live in York, all the different cultures that are there, what would thriving mean based on the values and the culture and history? And of course that question can only be answered by the people of York in conversation, in dialogue, as a community. These things, have, as, as those before me have just said, it can't be done top down by the authority. It has to be done together with the community. What does thriving here mean? What does a good holiday here mean, as Christian was talking about? What's a good way to spend our weekends? What's a good way to connect, even though you, like I, live in a tourist town, which is often thriving with tourists? How do we find spaces in our own hometowns where we feel, I want to be here, and I choose this, and I choose to stop and to stay? What would it mean for York to thrive within its natural habitat? So where on planet Earth is the city of York, the habitat and the ecosystem in which it's embedded? What is nature doing there? What's nature's genius in adaptation in that place? Steve was talking about flooding that's happening. How is nature responding to climate change? And how could York actually belong as part of that ecosystem? And these are the ideas of biomimicry that come from a brilliant thinker called Janine Benyus. If, you, if Janine were here, she'd say, York, take me to the wild land next door. Take me wherever in your heads is the, the intact natural ecosystem of this place. Let's go there and see what nature's doing there. And let's measure how much carbon dioxide she's sequestering in the forest. How much groundwater is being stored after a storm. How much biodiversity and, and species are being housed here from pollinators to wildlife. How much the forest is cooling the air from the treetops to the forest floor. How much it's cleaning the air and cleaning the water. And she'd say, let's take these metrics. Now, can York begin to aim to match that generosity of nature? Can York aim to sequester carbon, store groundwater after a storm or a flood? Can York aim to house biodiversity and pollinators to cool the air just like the wildland next door? To me, this is just a beautiful, wildly ambitious, but utterly natural ambition for our cities and places to belong in the ecosystems in which they're rooted. So these first two questions are what we call the local aspiration, thriving people in a thriving place. And that's well and good. But we know, especially in the global north, that our cities have huge impacts on people and planet worldwide because of everything that we import. Think of all the food, the clothing, the electronics goods, the consumer goods, the construction materials that are daily coming into the city and that stream of waste that's going out. So we have to ask also, how can York respect the health of the whole planet? In terms of the food that people are buying, where's it come from and what's being displaced in order to produce that food or the, the, the sources, the cotton and the fabrics for the clothing that are being bought or the materials and the mining for the construction that's happening. How can York come back within those planetary boundaries? Because like the UK, it will be in big overshoot. And, and I'm hearing a huge ambition locally in terms of carbon negativity and circularity. And that's brilliant. And that, that is the scale of ambition actually that should be normal everywhere in the global north by now. So kudos to you for leading that where you are. Again, I have no doubt this is gonna inspire and ripple out across the UK and far elsewhere. But also as we think about those global supply chains, let's think about the people in those supply chains who picked and packed the food, who stitched and sewed the clothes, who dug and transported the construction materials, who assembled our phones. How can York respect the well-being of people worldwide and know that the, the goods and services, whether they're being bought by the authority or being sold in the shops by the big corporations that have big shops in every major city and, and relationships throughout those supply chains? How do we make sure that the way people are living well in York respects 
the rights of workers and communities worldwide who are impacted by supplying those supply chains. So those are the four questions and they're being explored in different ways in different cities. Amsterdam was the first city, in fact, here's, here's Amsterdam city portrait, um, which was released just almost a year ago in April, 2020 at the height of Amsterdam's COVID infection. And it shows uh, a city that's got lots of overshoot of planetary boundaries. It shows a city that's got a lot of challenges Hiding from those challenges doesn't make them go away. And I, and I really respect Amsterdam for actually publishing it and looking at that mirror of the challenges and saying, right, this is the story we're going to turn around. And we can now, using this as a baseline, we can see ourselves making progress in all of these lenses. Local aspiration in the context of global responsibility. So that's the question we invite people to ask. I've focused on York, but of course, we could have just done it for Rydell as well. And as, as Sue was saying, you know, Rydell is a a market town, what would it mean for the people of Rydell to thrive and for Rydell to thrive within its natural habitat, a market town in a rural community. And these patterns of circularity and these patterns of transformation, of course, can be adapted and must connect towns to the rural constituency. They must because they are deeply interdependent. And that's an opportunity, again, to look at those relationships and to renew them and make them flourish intentionally through policy and through the way that supply and procurement is done. So here are some examples of uh, Donut City workshops that we held in Portland, Philadelphia and Amsterdam before anybody had heard of COVID, it was autumn of 2019. And these were city councillors and community members. We'd done their city portraits and they're sitting around it, talking about the interconnections between those four lenses that I just introduced, the local and the global, the social and the ecological, finding that holistic, as Christian said, that holistic thinking looking at the tensions and looking at the synergies and all of these people saying we are so ready to join up our work i'm so tired of working in a siloed way i do sewage you do education he does transport she does uh, racial equity come on these things all interconnect they're interdependent so let's bring them together so there was a lot of energy in the room and of course it was deeply frustratingly stopped by covid but amsterdam said no we're going to go ahead and publish because as we emerge from the emergency of covid we want a vision of where we want to go and this is the direction we want to go in. So what kinds of things come out of these conversations? For me, I think it's really important that we always start economics, not with what anybody who studied economics at university or school learned, which would be supply and demand, right? Welcome to economics is supply and demand of the market. That's a really narrow place to begin. I start here and I call this the embedded economy diagram. What this tells us is what should seem obvious, that the economy is embedded in society. It is a social construct. It's something we've invented. It's a way we meet our wants and needs and supplying each other. And that's embedded in the living world. We draw in Earth's matter and materials and we put out our waste and pollution. So we need economies that belong in that living world. But also if we look inside the economy, yes, there's the market. And in the market space, you might be seen as consumer or producer. You might be labor earning a wage. You might be capital owning the means of production and, and, and uh, earning a rent or return on that. But this is just one part of our economic identity in relation to the state, public servants who have been recognized beyond what's ever been seen before because of their role and importance in COVID. But we're residents of places, we're voters, we're protesters, all of these crucial roles we can play in relation to the state. The market and the state, that's the public and the private, but let's not forget the household, where we begin every day. We've been locked down for a year. We may be parent, partner relative or child. It's a place where people find joy. It's a place there's also a lot of stress and domestic violence because of the pressures that COVID have created there. But also the commons, where people come together as volunteers and sharers and co-creators and stewards. And if COVID's shown us one thing is that when market spaces are literally shut down because of the need for physical distancing, that's when we recognize the role of the state steps up and steps in and underpays, uh, 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 under, under covers everybody's wages through furlough. It's where we recognize the role of the household in looking after the ill, but also homeschooling kids and looking out for each other and the role of the commons, people stepping in, setting up food banks, community kitchens, just street contact uh, and, and schemes, helping each other get medicines from the pharmacy. That is crucial. So as we come out of COVID, I know people worldwide are saying, we don't want to lose that we of society that we feel that we've reconnected with in tough times. How can we create economies and local economies and carbon negative and circular economies that actually allow us to be in all of these roles in our lives? Because this is what makes life thriving and a community, all of these roles together. 
But also, I think we need to transform two fundamental dynamics in our economies. We've inherited economies that are degenerative by design. We take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we won't use it for a while, and throw it away. And that's running down the planet's life support systems. And they need to become regenerative by design. The circular economy that everyone's been talking about, where resources are used again and again for more collectively, more carefully, more creatively. So those transformations, what could that look like? Here are just some examples, and they're just illustrations of places that are really embracing regenerative design. So Oslo has said, we're just gonna have a car-free city centre. We're gonna have trams and bikes. People can get around, but it's for people. Let's reclaim that space for people and move the cars out. Paris famously during lockdown, repainted the lines on some of its biggest streets like Rue de Rivoli here and said, cars move over, here come the cyclists. And there's been a big upswell in the number of people cycling. I heard you saying you needed nine times the number of people biking. So research back from Paris has shown that actually many more people are starting cycling anew. More women are getting on bikes. So it's really opening up transport and, and mobility to a wider group of people in the city, which is great. Amsterdam embracing circularity and embracing circular construction. And I'll talk a little bit more about their, their ambitions there in a moment, but really saying, come on, this is, there are districts in the city now where we only experiment with circular construction, where materials have to be usable again and again and again. They'll have a materials passport. This is a new part of the regulations. And then the city of Medellin in Colombia, where the river used to be seen as a handy industrial sewer just to take all that stuff away. And they said, actually, no, if we look at the ecosystem, the river is the life at the heart of our city. Let's open it up. Let's put parks around it. Let's be, make it a place where people choose to come instead of choose to avoid. So let's regenerate the very landscape of our city. So those are just some examples of regenerative by design, but we also need to make sure that we create futures that move away from being divisive by design. We have inherited uh, business structures, infrastructures, and I think many institutions that drive and capture opportunity in the hands of a few. Globally, the number of billionaires worldwide has doubled in the last decade from 1,000 to 2,000. We need to create economies that are distributive by design, by which I mean the opportunity and value are shared far more equitably with everybody in society who co-creates it. So some examples of what that can look like. Well, I have to go first to Preston, and I'm sure you've heard and thought a lot about what they're doing in Preston. Preston, a place which lost the opportunity, what it saw as an opportunity for a big new shopping mall, it didn't happen. They suddenly realized nobody was coming from the outside to save them. They had to figure out the answer from within and started using the city's power of procurement, the anchor institutions of the city council, the schools, the hospital, the museums, to, and the universities to say, let's make sure the way we spend our budget actually is buying locally, buying from small enterprises, supporting that dense ecosystem of a local community enterprise and rebuilding, literally rebuilding the town market space so people could have a market and set up and tr try out new enterprises and sell, sell their produce on a Saturday morning. In uh, Vienna, interesting example of a city where housing, 60% of people in this city living, live in social housing. That's affordable, it's great, it's central because the city owns that much of the housing. The city owns the vast majority of the housing or it's owned by um, uh, cooperatives that also connect to the city council. And it just means that social housing is normal, affordable, high quality, and it means the city is much more affordable to live in than most cities like uh, uh, in a high income country like Austria. Living wages. So Seattle in the US was the first city to say we're going to pay everybody a, min a $15 minimum wage. And a lot of people said, well, that's going to be so expensive, we won't be able to afford to go to restaurants anymore. Actually, it turned out that even the wait staff in the restaurants could now afford to go to restaurants. And other cities that were seen just recently across the US are now adopting this. So what one state can lead and one city can lead then becomes a wider policy. And then again, uh, in uh, Bogota in Colombia, uh, a car park given a, a space, public space, given over to cars to just dump there. What happens when it gets turned into a, a play park for kids to meet, for parents to meet, for communities to meet, people like themselves and people not like themselves. And these are the kinds of local places where community actually gets built. And going back to what Christian said, where people say, no, I want to be here. I choose to be here because there's great places for us to gather in this community and it's for us. So regenerative by design, distributive by design. What really matters, I think, is the design of the institutions themselves. And in conversation with Amsterdam and other cities, I've heard from a lot of mayors and policymakers, they'll say, you know, we, 
we've inherited institutions that were really focused around serving growth as the 20th century was the idea that progress is this endless expansion of serving growth and our cities were always asking this one question how do we make our city grow but actually pioneering cities and the ones i'm finding myself talking to and i'm hearing it from people on this call are asking a very different question how do we make our city thrive and what is it about the design of our very institutions that enables that, that pivots us from one to another of those questions? I think it's these five design traits, and I'm just gonna give examples on each of them. So if we wanna have cities, <clears throat> cities and places that are serving, thriving. First of all, purpose. What are we in service of? What does the, what does the mayor or the town councillor speak about when they stand up and give a speech? Are they talking about growth and competition or thriving? Now, Amsterdam already had a plan to be circular, they had a plan to be low carbon, they had a plan for sustainability, they had a plan for community participation. It was when they encountered the donut, they said, oh, this gives us a frame that sits across everything that we already wanted to do. It brings it together in a holistic way. And I know that's a good part of why they adopted it. And they, they redrew it, Amsterdam Orange, and made it their own, which is fantastic. They have a policy, and, and you'll hear the mayor say this, their goal is to be a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting planetary boundaries. That is a mighty goal. But of course, it's no good if that's all you have. It has to be backed up by other designs. So networks, how can the city as administration think about all the relationships that it has? Glasgow was mentioned at the beginning. Glasgow is one of the places in the UK leading on circular economy. So they did a circular city scan and looked across, this is the food sector. They looked across food and lots of different sectors. What, what industries are already here? And how could the waste from one process become the food for the next? How could we actually, as a city, take a scan and see the potential links that could be created? And this is the beginning of a circularity that's not just one company reusing its own materials, but connecting companies and realizing that they need each other's flow of resources. Local recruitment initiatives. So in Cleveland, Ohio, one of the places that was a pioneer of anchor institutions, the university hospital, sits on the edge of a really low income neighborhood. And they realized that almost nobody who worked in the hospital was from that neighborhood. So they said, right, we are gonna use our procurement power, our employment possibilities to bring in people from that neighborhood. We're gonna create a scheme that actually helps people of color from lower ed educational backgrounds overcome what we thought they needed, but actually we can bring them in and train them in and they can get good jobs here. We're gonna help mothers returning from maternity leave to come back in. We're gonna help people who've had a conviction and deserve to have it wiped and be given a second chance. And so they've actually opened up employment for people in the hospital through that very intentional targeting opportunity for that community on their doorstep. And then the city of Melbourne in Australia, wanting to be a renewable powered city, but knowing that they couldn't do it, they couldn't get the contract they needed when they just tried to alone. So they brought together about 10 institutions across Melbourne, again, big anchor institutions that together offered fixed price for a 10 year contract. And that promise of purchase meant that a new wind farm could be constructed. And now Melbourne is run on renewable energy. So the power of using networks that the city has, and that's what the local enterprise partnership has the power. You have these networks. You can use that in many ways, which you're clearly already doing on governance setting ambitious regulations. So what I love about Amsterdam's circularity commitment is the Netherlands has said by 2050, we're gonna be a circular nation. And Amsterdam says we're gonna be 100% circular. Nobody knows what that means yet, as you don't yet know in York. And that's fantastic. It's like a moonshot ambition. Kennedy says, we're gonna to go to the moon. We don't have the materials. We don't know how we're gonna get there. That's the point, let's find out. So let's have that long-term goal, but that's too far away. So Amsterdam has a 50% a uh, circular materials by 2030 commitment. Now that's not even a decade away. That's real. That's that's like now planning. But then they also say in 2022, city contracts of procurement will in, must have 10% at least circular materials. So that trio of long-term goal, decadal ambition, next year's commitment, to me really puts in place a very powerful, long, loud legal message to business. We are transforming, we're going circular. And if you want to be part of this, com this community in the future, you need to go circular with us. Let's start tomorrow. They've also put in place um, districts like Bike Schlotterham, where they're learning through experiment. I showed a picture earlier. Everything that happens here is part of a circular living lab. People were talking on this call about experimenting and learning and cities and places are such key spaces for learning that the nation won't adopt a policy, but learning from what happened in a city or a region. Oh, it worked. Now we can spread. 
So learning through experiment and knowing some things will fail, but they didn't fail, we just learned from them. And then creating new metrics and Amsterdam's creating metrics to monitor that circular economy. I'm sure you're thinking about that too in York and, and Rydell and, and Malton. How are you gonna know that you're becoming circular? What do those metrics look like? They're very different from those 20th century metrics by which we guided our economies. I want to just give one quick example. Cornwall has taken the donut. They've turned it into their own decision-making wheel. And then they've started doing the Cornish donut, looking at it through these different lenses. So that's just a quick example of what one place in the UK has already started doing, adapting it and making it work for them. And now all local planning decisions that need to be made go through this decision-making wheel and they use it to check, you know, is it bringing us into the donut socially and ecologically? Back here, ownership. We have to talk about how things are owned and support a more distributed ownership of the sources of wealth creation. I'm talking about land and housing. Who owns the land and housing and how can more housing be owned in such a way that it's affordable to more people? Who owns the utilities? Steve was talking about community owned energy. Really important to make that possible, to bring the, the ownership of utilities back into communities that they can actually shape the future and bring the future we want forward faster, but also benefit from that capacity to generate energy and take pride in being part of a renewable future. Who owns the data that we know is going to become more and more important? Barcelona is a city that said we're committed to open data and respecting our, our residents' data sovereignty. And who owns enterprise? Are we going to allow our high streets to be dominated by multinational chains that will come and go as the season changes for them? Or like Preston, encourage more locally owned regionally based enterprises that will be part of the community because they belong. In America, they call them sticky, right? Uh, employee owned and family owned enterprises, they're sticky, they stick around. They're not gonna up and leave. They stick around, they belong and they have connections and that's what makes that web of economic uh, community. So lastly, finance. Where does the city get its revenue from? Uh, Portland is a city in the US that got a lot of revenue from car parking charges. Well, what happens if you take the cars out of the city center? We've got to find new sources of revenue. City budgeting, of course, how can we build in all of these demands into that budget process? City banking, the financial crisis made many cities realize that the, the big multinational banks aren't particularly interested in serving small and medium enterprises. So it's setting up more their own banking like Van City in Vancouver, making finance available to that web of local enterprise that they want to encourage. And then city investments and divestments, as I think uh, Christian said, uh, if, if uh, York is on the verge of moving the pensions, that's great news because more and more cities are moving their pension funds out of things we know, we know we don't want and moving it into investments that we want to bring forward for the future. So let me stop there and just turn it back and say how listening through your ears and your experience and your plans, how can York and, York and North Yorkshire, LEP and, and beyond ensure that all of these design traits serve in favour of the futures that you already want to bring about. And of course, it's, it's the local council and the anchor institutions, it's the business networks, it's the community-based organizations, it's the universities, the schools, the colleges, the NGOs and think tanks, everybody being involved. As I can tell from what everyone in this call said, that's what makes it really rich and fly. Lastly, in Amsterdam, community members from all those different networks got together and they said, well, we're gonna launch the Amsterdam Donut Coalition because we want to put the donut into practice in our communities, in our schools, in our businesses. And again, the peer-to-peer -peer inspiration of them doing that meant that people all over the place from Malaysia to California to Ireland to Berlin have said, well, we're going to do that in our place. And now those people have got together and starting organizing together. So for us at Donut Economics Action Lab, it's fantastic to see the change makers organizing together, learning from each other about what to bring it to life. And if, if anyone on this call is interested, I put donuteconomics.org slash contact, get in touch with us and let us know that you'd be interested in starting one where you are we can hook you up with these folks and you could learn a lot from them. Lastly, um, we set up Donut Economics Action Lab because people all over the place started getting really playful with the idea of the donut, as you can see. And so the Action Lab is a platform that everybody is welcome to join or to browse. You can use our tools, you can see what's happening there and you can share back stories from your own experience because we know it's these stories of practice that inspire one and another. So I'm gonna stop there and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, lots of things I suppose we've all picked up, which will speak to different people. We've got people from everywhere here listening, so we will all have our own response. I'll, I'll just 
sum up two or three things that struck me as someone from, from York. Uh, obviously, all those examples from other local authorities and other countries are always inspiring. Um, the key is then how do we bring that into our own, uh, our own experience, our own area. Um, a few phrases that really resonate with me. Uh, I love the, the expression of changing the term from how do we make our city grow to how do we make our city thrive. That is indeed the challenge, isn't it? Um, when you mentioned cities dependent on car parking revenue, it hit me like an arrow because it's, it's one of the challenges in York is that here we are doing all this work to try and move away, but we're so utterly dependent on six or seven million pounds of funding that comes in through the car parks. And it's how we transform those models and find better ways of earning revenue. Um, for me, as I've seen it in other cities, I, I see cities in Europe creating tram networks specifically to generate revenue, creating different kinds of power station and power generation capacity to create revenue, to, to tip that in a different way. Um, I was impressed by um, the various things, the encouraging micro businesses in Preston, uh, the, the map you showed us early on comparing Malawi with China and the UK was very powerful. And I loved the word stickies, I'd never heard it before, as a way of talking about local business. And there's a great truth to that, uh, that I think is one that we can all learn from, that we've got this reservoir within our, within our territory of people who have a vested interest in being there and not leaving. Um, so I've, I've been checking the Q&A while, while you've been speaking. And I, I think I'll pass over to Katie soon, but there were, three, there were three of the questions that I thought were really pertinent and, and that it would be great to hear your views on, Kate. Um, the first was from Irina Bauman who said, how do we make sure the donut economy approach does not become an idea of a moment in time, as have so many other things? And I know that that must be a fear that is with us all, all the time, is that we, we find a one planet York and then it was a one planet York. We embrace energy cities and then it becomes something of the past. How do we work to in, ensure that this concept is not lost. So that would be the first question I've picked up from the Q&A, uh, Kate. Great, thanks. Um, so for me, if in a decade's time, nobody's talking about donuts, I wouldn't mind at all, because it's a playful idea that's coming through, that's helping bring an idea back. What matters to me is that we move towards having economies that are not degenerative but are the regenerative and that are not divisive but are distributive and that means that we're coming back within planetary boundaries and meeting the needs of people who are currently deprived now that's currently framed as a donut what, what i'm trying to say here is it's really important not to get overly hooked up on particular instantiations and frameworks and names and brands and logos because what really matters are the ideas that sit underneath them and so from our point of view, we've never once asked or begged or requested or encouraged even anybody to use the donut. Everything that's ever happened in terms of where people have chosen to pick it up is because they have said, we think this is useful for us here. And that's great. And if it's useful as part of their journey, and we definitely wouldn't want it to displace something else that they were using, blend it, mix it, take the ideas from it, don't name it, don't, you have to, don't, you don't have to use the name donut. If all somebody takes away today is, wow, from degenerative to regenerative, what would a regenerative city be? What would a distributive city be? That's job done, as far as I'm concerned. So let's always remember the deep dynamics and then things show up in different names and uh, they can be useful and it, to the extent that they're useful, let's use them, but let's make sure we're making those deeper dynamics transform. That's a great answer. And then basically you're saying, don't worry, it's not about names, it's about the bigger picture, it's about where we're going. And, and I suppose it would be the same when we sit in local authorities sometimes, we, we can get so bogged down in thinking that the world is about carbon emissions and that climate change is about carbon emissions. It's yeah. 
I don't care about reducing carbon emissions. I, I care about my planet thriving. Yeah, exactly. So, it's a, it's a, you're, you're saying that the donut, the donut is not the key. It's what we're trying to achieve with the donut. I am saying that, although, I, although I'm going to come back to Irene's question because I think she's tapping into something um, important too, which is deeper, which is why is it that we keep starting these initiatives and then they kind of stop and then we start another one and they stop? And I think part of it is because actually we do come up against entrenched ways of doing things. We come up against vested interests that don't want to change. So, and I think sometimes our, the, the initiatives bounce off institutions, whether it's national government or business, old fashioned, old style business that actually doesn't want to change. So I'm gonna, this, this to me where it, it does matter. And that's why I really like talking, um, taking on the challenge of saying, look, what we need to do is get into the donut in terms of meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. This is not controversial. This is basic human values. Now, we need to be regenerative and distributive. Now, I invite business into the room. Now, I invite government policy into the room and say, how are you going to show us that the way you're designing your business and the way you're designing government policy is bringing us into this space? And sometimes, that is where we actually hit old tensions of interests that do want to capture value in few hands. There are, of course. And so I, 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 we can't shy away from it. And so I, I really like talking with mainstream business saying, I invite you into this space and show me how you're going to make sure the way your business is designed, its purpose, networks, governance, ownership and finance is going to be aligned to the 21st century goal. So I'm guessing that's partly why Irene's question is coming up, because these ideas that, that are carried by donut economics, they're not new. They've been around for many, many decades in many forms. Donut economics brings them together in a certain way and puts the donut in front and puts it together with a picture. But this is about transformation and it's about old forms of power letting go, whether it's old forms of fossil fuel power, for example, right? Those fossil fuel companies that did not want to let go and now it's time to let go and we are moving on. And sometimes that's why ideas get bounced off and well, oh, it's too hard. Let's do something else. So I think I, I just wanted to name that because I think it is one of the reasons why ideas get some traction, but then have to get put aside because they're coming too close to challenging something that doesn't want to be challenged. And it's time for it to be challenged and time to transform. Yeah, that's great. And it reminds me of a phrase that I heard a while ago that was both funny and very true, which was that the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones. <laughs> This is another way of, of saying yes. that. So, uh, our second question is from uh, Debbie Cobbett. Again, I think it's a very important question. How, how can donut economics and sustainable development goals be mentioned in the same breath? So basically, how do we reconcile the fact that the donut begins from the, the premise of the impossibility of limitless GDP growth, whereas sustainable development goals appear to be based on the idea of continuing growth. So Debbie's gone to the heart of what, what some people call the Trojan horse in the sustainable development goals. So let me just make sure everyone's on with it. So here's, here's the donut. Got to have a donut on a stick. There are benefits of lockdown. You get to make a donut on a stick. Um, so what Debbie's saying, so, so here are these 12 um, social issues that are at the heart of the donut. They are from the sustainable development goals. I took them from the SDGs because that's a really strong, credible source. The world's governments have agreed that everyone has the right to energy, food, water, housing, health, education, income. But the outside comes from earth system science. So it's a combination of the social goals of the donut and earth system science. What this doesn't bring from the sustainable development goals is what Debbie's pointing out, which is one of the goals, um, goal eight, is about decent work and economic growth. So decent work, absolutely. People need inc good, decent income and decent work. But the donut does not write into it the promise of endless economic growth. Now, let me be really clear. I think there are many countries in the world where economic growth is absolutely needed. Malawi, look at Malawi, right? To meet people's needs, essential. And that country should go through a big growth curve, regeneratively, distributively to do that. But what the SDGs do is write in the idea that every country everywhere will continually grow. And I think that is um, a really important thing to question. What we know we need to do is thrive. And some sectors will grow for sure. Renewable energy, circular economy. This is the space where new enterprise can get set up and really can thrive. But some sectors need to let go and leave as well. So I use these sustainable development goals. I use the social part of it because those are really valuable traits. 
we can put aside the growth, the, the growth goal, but then invite government policy, invite business back in and say, just show me how it's going to be compatible with living within planetary boundaries. That's great, thank you. I, I will pass on one more of these questions and then I'll hand over to you, Katie. Uh, so the, the third question I've picked out is from the Rydale Environment Group. And it says, economies of scale, lack of local resource and insufficient man manpower, solidarity with less, fortune, uh, less fortunate nations, surely make a 100% circular economy both undesirable and impossible. Does the answer lie in carbon neutral transport to allow continuing connectivity? So I suppose it's about the balance of where, how far we're prepared to go, how, how dogmatic we are and how flexible we can be. Right, great question. So if I said I'm committed to a circular economy and I'm gonna live in a 100% circular economy within my house, that would mean that everything I use has to come from within the footprint of my house and garden. And that would be near impossible. I mean, I've got solar panels on the roof, but I didn't mind the materials for the solar panels in my garden. They came from across the world. So of course, the idea of a totally local, 100% circular economy isn't possible. But when we say circular economy, what we really are talking about is belonging back to the cycles of the living planet. So more than getting obsessed with the kind of percentage of circularity locally. Let's just step back and say, we know that humanity needs to create economies that belong on planet Earth. And that means we need to reconnect with the carbon cycle. And that's why your goal of not just carbon neutrality, but carbon negativity, because you know that, you know, net zero is just a passing point towards sequestering more carbon than we release. So reconnect with the carbon cycle, connect with the water cycle, connect with the nutrient cycle and recognize that we've actually been living beyond the limits of these cycles. We've been pushing these cycles out of bounds. We need to come back within. And it's crucial therefore that we reuse Earth's materials, whether they're fabrics or um, mining and composites for building. We reuse these materials rather than thinking there's an endless stream of them because there ain't. So 100% a circular economy or a fully circular economy will be one that really recognize the value of material that everything is like a battery, right? So I've got, a, I've got a, an old iPhone here. It's about eight years old. It's, I, it's almost about to give up on me, but it's an amazing battery of energy in the sense it's, it's packed with metals and materials that should never be just discarded, but used again and again. So to be a full, to my mind, fully circular economy is one where we change our mindset and we recognize that this is a battery of resources and should be mined. And we need to design economic systems and business models so that that will happen to it and it will be used again and again. Now, you don't want it only to happen in the household or indeed just within a market town, everything connects. And that was why that picture I showed from Glasgow of where are those loops and what is the scale of those loops? And what's the scale of loops of plastics recycling or metals recycling? What's the scale of loop of organic material reuse? These will all be on different scales. Humanity is only just beginning to learn this because we never bothered to do industry this way before. We just took a stream. We kept extracting and we kept throwing away and it's, it's come boomeranging back at us. Now we have to learn. So to me, a fully circular economy is one in which we have a commitment to seeing the earth works in cycles and we need to belong to it. And it'll happen at multiple scales, of course. But I do think it will bring a lot of enterprise, manpower, and I have to say a lot of woman power back home so that people will be refurbishing and refitting and repairing and remaking and retrofitting locally. And that creates good local jobs. Those jobs are sticky too. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I will now pass over to Katie so she can pick out some of the questions that have really sp spoke to her and, and over to you. Yes, hi. Um, firstly, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. It was really inspiring and, uh, yeah, really sort of delved deep into some of the things we're, we're trying to tackle in this area. It's great. Um, there's a few questions in the chat that have centred on the idea of any advice and tips you've got for uh, winning hearts and minds. Um, particularly, we've had comments in the, in the chat and in the questions and answers about um, winning over um, councillors, uh, councils, and all the way up to national government, um, and also specifically the um, how do we start these conversations and make them stick 
with uh, large businesses um, in the area. Uh, that, that's it's sort of an amalgamation of about four or five different questions in the chat there. So um, hopefully you can give us a bit of a, a feel to those uh, multiple things there. Um, that was a point just to, just to follow up on that. One of those things about um, councillors is getting them ready to step out of party political boxes. If you've got any sort of points on that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, really important question, Katie. Thank you. And I'm really glad it was inspiring. I have to say again, what you folks are doing is inspiring to me because if, if you weren't doing what you're doing, what I'm talking about is just ideas on the page. And the fact that you're doing it and other places and cities and towns are doing it shows that actually these are ideas that want to jump off the page and are in practice. And, and everything I'm sharing is examples from other places. And you're going to bet that I'm going to be telling other places about what's going on in York and North Yorkshire. So um, kudos back to you. Advice and tips on winning over councillors and big business. So I, what I'm learning is that the most powerful persuaders are someone just like me who's doing that thing I thought was impossible. So if I'm a counselor, I'm gonna be most influenced by seeing, just hearing a counselor from another place who says, oh yeah, of course we do it like this. Oh yeah, we used to be stuck in that way. Well, we used to think it would be, oh, we had so many battles in, you know, in council meet, oh, we got so stuck. But yeah, we, we're just doing it like this. And actually everybody's behind it now and it's flowing like this and these are the benefits, blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's just powerful and persuasive and real in a way that nobody else trying to make that argument can reach. So I've done events with a woman called Evelyn Yonkov, who is the head of sustainability of Amsterdam. If anybody's interested, if you go on our platform and Google Amsterdam, you'll find several webinars of me in conversation with Evelyn or my Marika van Duranink, the De deputy mayor of Amsterdam. Those women talking about what they're doing in their city or Barbara Tracht in Brussels, talking about what they're doing, that is powerful stuff because they're the real policy makers and they're doing it and, and they're, they're talking to the reality. And then with business, I would say the same. Big businesses everywhere around the world know that they, they might be feeling pressure. You know, are, do you feel like you're putting pressure on them from the locally in the community? But there's pressure globally on business to transform, to get carbon emissions out of their supply chains. It's coming from all sides and it's only going to move in one direction, which is carbon out, renewables in. And, and towards more circular. And I know that more and more companies are looking, you know, circularity, oh, what a bind, what a, you know, how, 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 how frustrating. Initially, it seems like this regulation imposed on us. And then they start looking sideways and seeing, there's all these companies actually that are doing urban mining that have recognized there's huge value in these so-called waste streams. Why would you throw that away? Uh, there's huge value to be reached. And if you adapt your model from ownership to service, to bringing back that chain, to recognizing the waste from one company becomes food for the next, there is new business model there. And the regulation that's already running in Amsterdam is just gonna become normal everywhere. Like, so take Amsterdam as a beacon of what's gonna be normal. We're gonna have regulations saying circularity in materials. So I would say to companies, do you wanna, do you wanna be the laggard? Do you wanna wait and, and, and have to catch up? Or do you wanna get ahead of the curve on this and actually be the ones who figure it out and get recognized for that? But also draw in the young graduates who want to do this. Draw in the young people who want to use the new education they've just got and put it into practice. It's got to be in your favor to change because change is not gonna go away, this is happening. So get with it. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna pick up on a question um, from Hugo Fernley. Um, I'll read it out verbatim. Uh, interested to hear you mention the legacy of colonialism and associated economic systems that tend towards exploitation and monopolization of wealth and power. Lots of long words in this one. <laughs> How do we dismantle these embedded systems? And specifically, what importance do you place on the fall of land ownership as a part of dismantling this legacy and reinvigorating common ownership? That is a big question, Hugo. <laughs> okay, so... First of all, so when I'm when I'm talking about donor economics at the global scale, I think it's really important, as I as I showed, to talk about the relationships between countries. So there's a lot of history around impacts and around resource use and who controls what resources in the world. And look, we're sitting here in the UK, which we know had a, a worldwide global empire, which with a long legacy of which all of us in the UK are beneficiaries, and some people have suffered their families and their histories, and some nations have have experienced uh, huge losses at the, at the hands of that legacy. So we have to start by recognizing it. 
When we come to look at the land ownership within the UK, I think it's also just really important. The, the land ownership in, in the UK is incredibly concentrated compared to many other countries. Uh, and, and it's really important to just to recognize that and say, it could be different. Can we create community land trusts? Can we bring some of the, even some of the privately held land, can it be put aside for rewilding? Can we change, if we don't change the land ownership, can we change its use? Can we change the purpose to which it's put? Is it put towards um, extracting financial return or is it put towards actually ecological restoration? So there are many, many um, diverse ways. And I wouldn't say there's one way that land should be owned. I just think it's really important to recognize. And that's why it's the first one I showed about ownership. How is land and housing owned? Who owns, who owns that, that, mean, that means of production? Because it has huge influence on what can and can't be done, on zoning. Um, so I think it's just a really important conversation to open up. Excellent, thanks for that. Um, we've covered off most of the questions in the Q&A. Um, obviously, I've amalgamated a few together at various points. I've noticed that there's quite a lot of activity going on through the chat, and I've given Erin the uh, perhaps unenviable task of um, pulling out any questions that uh, maybe ended up in, in the wrong pile, should we say. Erin, um, has anything come forward? Um, no, I've been directing people to pop their, um, uh, most of their questions in the Q&A box where possible. I think what's really come out for chat is the amount of enthusiasm and the amount of uh, willingness to make connection between all sorts of different organisations, which is fantastic. It's exactly what we want to see. Um, so I think if we can uh, ensure that we're, we're doing something to, to carry this enthusiasm forward and uh, get everyone connected with everyone else, then that'd be great. I would love to ask a question back to all of you, any, any of you who want to answer that. What do you, why, why is this happening in York and North Yorkshire? What, what do you think is the attributes of your region or the community or the change makers who are there that's making this happen? Because getting things going like this. You know, I know people in places all over the UK or indeed all over Europe and the world who say, why isn't change happening here? And they'll look to you and they'll listen to this and say, why, how, how, how come this place is so in action on climate neutral and negativity and circular economy? How is that happening? And I'd love to just hear from you. What, what are the opportunities that you're seeing coming through that would enable you to show other places the benefits of moving forward like this. And I don't know who, who amongst you are going to pick those up. Well, I can see that Steve's got a hand up, so I'll let Steve yeah. first. I, I, I can give you a, a personal perspective from Rydale. We, we had a very big environmental campaign over the past six years, which helped raise awareness in the area on, on, on environmental issues. Uh, and, and we are blessed, actually, with, with some really fantastic community groups in the area. Obviously, with Sue's work at um, at Circular Moulton as well. And the council actually that does have, have a lot of em empathetic councillors on the council. And looking in the chat actually, I'm, I'm kind of pushing, I know some of the councillors are in this, this meeting, I'm kind of pushing them to a position say, okay, we need to make our council take a lead in this in the area and bring the stakeholders together, the community groups together, the business together and the charities together. And, I, and, and I'm going to challenge the councillors in the, here now to say, come on then, let's get the motion into council at the next meeting, the one after, and make this happen and help Sue achieve Circular Moulton, help the other local towns and help Rydale de develop a donut economy. Because we have, and I, I know from our database records, we have 3,000 people in our database with YO postcodes all engaged in green activity. And straight after this meeting, we will be emailing every single one of them with the recording of this meeting and asking them all to get involved and connect together. That's what we're doing here. Um, I, I can't answer for let. I know I know where the motivations are coming from, but that for me personally, just for Rydale and being a councillor in Rydale, that that's my motivation. I can give you an answer, Kate, from from my perspective, uh, and it relates back to a question that was asked earlier that Katie raised about how do you get through to politicians. And it's been my good fortune to work with the Covenant of Mayors and Energy Cities in Europe and to learn from people there. And one of the key things I learned early on was from a, a, a man called Beau Frank, who was, may still, maybe still is, the mayor of Vecre in Sweden. And they're the city that I think is closest to being carbon neutral in Europe. And 
I asked him, you know, how on earth is it that you're so far ahead of, of the rest of us? And he explained that way back in 1990, all the political parties sat around a table and agreed that whatever else they disagreed about on achieving a zero carbon future, they would all work together. And every single year since then, they publish annual figures on the progress towards that target they've made. And throughout that period, the document isn't signed by the party in power. The document is signed by all the parties in the city. And when I got the chance to lead the Climate Change Committee uh, in 2019, one of the things I put on the table was specifically from what I'd learned. And I said, the Climate Change Committee must have as its aspiration for all the parties to be around the table, for everyone to be informed. I think that one of the key mistakes people make from outside local authorities is to think that the secret is to talk to the mayor or to talk to the party in power, forgetting the fact that the parties in opposition are tomorrow's parties in power. And that decisions are better made if everyone works towards the, the same goal or, or makes them do better than they would have done. So if you've got a party in power that says, let's increase recycling, for example, by 10%, you either have a situation where the other parties say, the public doesn't like recycling, let's not do that because that's how I be the opposition. Or you have an informed opposition that says, why only 10%? Haven't you heard what they're doing in Oslo? You could make it 20%. And so if we can find models where all politicians are informed, then they can still play leapfrog. They can still, we can still demonstrate our value to our electorate, but instead of doing it by opposing what is proposed, we can just push what is proposed further towards a common goal. And, and so for me, that is, if, if York is ahead, I'm not sure York is ahead really, but what I do feel is that we, we do have a common engagement. So next week, we have a motion coming to full council uh, calling for our regional uh, pension fund to invest in green infrastructure. And I'm very confident that we'll get unanimous or near unanimous support because we try to engage everyone so we understand what we're doing. And if we do that, then I think local authorities can thrive. And just to pick up on that, I know that when Amsterdam published their uh, city portrait that I showed in April last year, six weeks later, the City Council of Copenhagen voted with a vast majority in favor to say we want to explore what it would mean for Copenhagen to become a donut city. And that's because um, a city councillor called Fanny Broholm had talked to everybody across the political spectrum and done really exactly like what you're saying, Christian, done the work of talking to everybody and saying, this is not a party for political issue. It's not left wing, right wing. Donuts don't have wings. This is a shared vision for humanity. Now, different parties may have different view about how we get there, the kinds of policies and the things we need to do, but let's share this vision. And so I, I really, really like what you say. And it's about recognizing that everybody needs to be on board and, and speaking across that spectrum. And then that the, the duration of that support in the, the Swedish town you mentioned, that's really impressive. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to briefly bring in Sue Jefferson, um, who's uh, wanted to respond to your questions there. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Sue, I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> that's I just wanted to bring a perspective that's not sort of council um, led and I saw in the chats um, of people else that had to get started or you know facing inertia and I want to say look I think there's several ingredients and the good news is you don't have to have them all because I don't think I think Yorkshire is special but that's that's me but I think it can be replicated um, in lots of places and what I'd say is our region is very diverse. It's economically diverse. And also um, from a land point of view, we've got rural, we've got coastal, we've got urban. And that brings lots of challenges that we know about. And, and I think it was a mindset to say, but what are the opportunities to, to leverage what you've got? Which I think, look, look at what your, your place has that you can turn into opportunities. I think also have a mindset of 
uh, action, not talk, uh, which I, I see a lot of. And remember, change comes from a very few people always. So do look bottom up, go from within, stone in a pebble. One person talked about they've got a, a very poor lep. Um, I think we've got a fantastic uh, local enterprise partnership, but go change that lep. Go get yourself in, make yourself a, a nuisance and so on. And I think for me, the magic was the circular economy for me was something that said, this is a win-win. This is not environment or economy. This is something that can win with the economy, win with the social side and people and win with the environment. Uh, and I think that the donut thinking is exactly the same thing. So now you've, we have a um, a solution that works, tell people about it and get people engaged and don't worry about um, the uh, what can't be done, look at what can be done and just get started because as you can see here there's an excitement from all sorts of different people and we're not all eco warriors, we just see this is a better solution and, um, and as I said I think we have a very good partnership and coalition really of minds who want the same goal so find that same goal so you've got the local enterprise partnership the directors of development across the the different councils all say this is a win this is what we want our region our town to be so there's many things to pick up but change be the change you want to see which i know is a well-known phrase but you know it's amazing what can be achieved that's fantastic thank you thank you sue um, I think we're coming to the end of our, our, our period here. Um, I'm really grateful to you, Kate, for helping us understand how we can challenge mindsets and, and the powerful message that the economics, the economics of the 20th century cannot be the economics of the 21st century. And that, I think, is at the heart of, of you, what you've explained today. Um, the, the whole business about thinking differently is also key to everything, challenging mindsets. And it reminds me again of just a phrase I read in a book called The Clock of the Long Now by Stuart Brand a, a, a few years ago it, that showed how you just change a couple of words in a sentence and you change everything. And it was about waste. And he said, it'd be so easy to solve this one. All the UN needs to do is pass a law, a single sentence that says, from tomorrow, all waste will be discharged upstream. <laughs> and it, it, it shows how just tiny little changes in our thinking can transform the way we engage with the world and engage with the challenges that we face. So I wanna thank everyone so much for participating in this and the hundreds who've uh, watch this on webcam and all the questions that have been asked. I was wondering, Katie, if we could keep those questions long enough for questions to be answered that haven't been answered here. Yeah. That would be wonderful. I'll be sorting out a, a little uh, follow-up list of questions and, and hopefully Kate will be able to, to give us um, some extra words on that as well so late later. Brilliant. Yes, Steve, you had a last I, I have uh, one question for Kate. Um, Obviously, I know I'm talking to Rob already in your team, um, but I'd like to, to ask, uh, once we've um, started setting things in motion up here, is, um, is we, can, we can engage with the deal team to help us drive this mindset up here in this area. It'd be fantastic. And it, it, whether it's us or whether it's other change makers like yeah. yourselves in other places, because they're the ones, and I've seen there's folks on this course, someone from Berlin, other groups around the world who are already doing it. And, and there's so much to learn from what they're doing because they're in a place putting it into practice. So they're the ones who actually know from, just like people have been sharing here, what has traction, how it's working. So please, yeah, yeah join I, I, and uh, let's put it into practice. The resources that are on your um, organization's website are really, really useful. I'm a member already. Great. But I'm going through the Amsterdam one at the moment, but there's so many things just popping up from around the world on there now, it's brilliant. And we're only just getting started. So is, please do join, share back, and, and I, I tell you, you're going you're to inspire other people in other places too. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to everyone. And uh, I hope that maybe in a year's time, we'll do this again and have much more to talk about, even more to talk about. That would be good. Um, so thank you, and uh, we'll, we'll meet again.
Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Are we still live, Katie? We're still live for now. Um, I was slightly worried I would lose the questions and answers in the chat if I hung up. So I'm <laughs> going to leave it live for a moment. I have saved the chat.